ago, my dad died at Disney World. Sometime after the light parade, but before eating Mickey Mouse pancakes the next morning, his heart stopped. Even though he died very young, my dad had a rich and interesting and complicated life. I feel like you should know a little bit about it, so I'm going to give you the short version. My dad grew up in Sudbury, Massachusetts. In his sophomore year of college, he met my mom and married her six weeks later. The next year, they had me. By the time my dad graduated from Harvard Law School in 1985, they had three kids. Here we are that summer when my dad took us to Disney World for the first time to celebrate passing the bar exam. My parents moved south for work. Uh, they worked together, they traveled together, they started and lost businesses together, and they had three more kids. Then my dad got sick. Here he is shortly before he went to Disney World for the last time. He took this trip because he'd recently gotten a report from his Lyme disease specialist saying that he'd nearly beaten the parasite he'd been battling for over 10 years. So he took my two youngest sisters to the Magic Kingdom to celebrate his recovery. Now I have studied and taught English for, um, well, for half my life now. I know irony when I see it. I also know that irony is, is funny and intellectually satisfying in stories, but devastating in real life. You see, when my dad got sick, he didn't get a disease that's named after a celebrity or that has its own 5K. He got Lyme disease, which is an often misdiagnosed, misunderstood, and uncertain sickness. For a long time, really the whole time my dad was sick, I had no idea how to even begin to talk about his sickness. But after he died, I started to ask questions. Like what had gone so horribly wrong here? Why had it taken my family seven years to get a diagnosis? And why, even after getting a diagnosis, did most people in the medical community still question my dad's disease? Would anybody ever say to a cancer patient, you'll get better as soon as you decide to get better? Really, I, I did more than, than question. I started to obsess about these things, if I'm being honest. I, I read everything I could find that had anything to do with sickness in general, or with Lyme disease in particular. I was an adjunct professor at the time, so I started a course that I called Sick Lit. This was my way uh, to make sure that I was paid for my obsession. And this, is, this is actually a little secret. This is what all professors do. Um, <laughs> so I, I even went back to school uh, to get a PhD in narrative medicine. And I spent four years like this, uh, searching and silent. None of it was really what I needed or even what I wanted, but I, I didn't know what else to do. And pretty soon I began to notice uh, in my reading and at narrative medicine conferences that when people talk about narrative medicine, they really mean only one of two things. They're either talking about narrative as a diagnostic tool. So like think about the TV show House here. Narrative is something that doctors can use. If they, if they understand their patients' life stories better, they can get to a diagnosis more quickly. Uh, or they're talking about this idea of narrative as a therapeutic tool. So stories, uh, stories are things that patients tell themselves in order to cope with their diseases, especially when they know that they're not going to get better. Uh, but because of, of my background and my life experience, though, I, I was, found this fascinating, but, but it just didn't seem to be uh, enough for me. I was more interested in the role that story can play, not as a medical tool, but as story. The role that story plays as this imaginative, sympathetic, and cultural force. In other words, I was interested in the role that story plays in determining what counts as a disease in the first place. So let me explain. Um, like if you, if you have cancer or any other disease from the established disease canon, from this register of approved diseases, if you have cancer, people will listen to you. If you have cancer, people will run 5Ks and pass acts in Congress and start telethons and buy bracelets and pink things to the tune of billions of dollars a year to raise funds for research. If you have Lyme disease, you'll get letters from your health insurance company saying that they can't cover any of your treatment because the IDSA guidelines don't recognize your condition. If you have Lyme disease, you will go broke while you're going for broke. If you have cancer and you're a kid, the Make-A-Wish Foundation will see to it that you get to meet your favorite celebrity or go to Disney World. If you have Lyme disease and you're a kid, your gym teacher will tell you that you have to dress out unless you can get a note from your doctor, and your teachers will fail you for missing too many days of class. 
If your dad has cancer, people will organize workshops and therapy groups for you and tell you that it's OK to express your feelings. If your dad has Lyme disease, people will tell you that he doesn't love you, that if he loved you, he would get better. If your husband has cancer, ladies from your church will show up at your door with casseroles. If your husband has Lyme disease, ladies from your church, people in your own family will tell you that you should leave him. They will call you an enabler. But you'll be too busy helping him crawl from his bed to the couch or studying him as he stands so that he can use the bathroom to wonder what exactly you're enabling him to do. If people ask, is your dad sick, and you say, he has cancer, their eyes will well up, and they will say, you know, if there's anything we can do, and they will mean it. If people say, is your dad sick, and you say, he has chronic Lyme disease, they'll look confused for a minute, and then they'll smile and shake their heads and say, well, at least it isn't cancer. Now, I want to be very clear here that my point is not to pick on cancer. I'm not trying to make any comparison between the two diseases as diseases. As diseases, they're actually very similar. They're both devastating. They both involve treatments that kill healthy cells. I've lost friends and family members to both. But there are significant differences between the two diseases culturally. Uh, Susan Sontag has written this amazing book, this great book called Illness as Metaphor. And in it, she explains that people tend to stigmatize diseases when they don't understand them. We have done this throughout time, every culture, every time period, every disease. In the 19th century, most people saw consumption as this sort of um, disease for the romantic literary genius. Consumption was this disease that took the young and the beautiful and the, the poet who burned too brightly for this world. In the 20th century, cancer was seen as this disease uh, uh, that was kind of the opposite of consumption. It was this disease of repression. So, so you got cancer if you um, just held everything inside of you, all of your desires and all of your life energies, until they started to just metastasize and grow malignantly inside of you. And now in the 21st century, people are explaining away Lyme disease and then other invisible and mental illnesses as diseases for paranoid hypochondriacs. These are diseases that people get when they need to have a disease. And the main problem with these illness metaphors that we create is that we don't create them to comfort the sick. We create them to comfort the well. We create them to reassure ourselves that, that we are above sickness, that sickness is a personality quirk. It's something that happens to those people, or it's, it's worse than that. It's something that those people caused and not something that happened to them. So 50 years ago, cancer actually was Lyme disease. Culture swept it under the rug. Nobody talked about it. Or if they did, they were embarrassed or ashamed. These are films that have come out in the last five years about cancer. These aren't, even, these aren't all of them. This is about half of the films that have come out in the last five years about cancer. And these are only sort of relatively mainstream narrative feature films. These aren't independent films. These aren't documentaries or TV movies or, or short films. Major studios have put out over 60 films about cancer in the last five years. That means that they're putting out movies about cancer at a rate of one a month. Someone could literally start a cancer movie of the month club. These are films about Lyme disease that have come out in the last five years. So this is kind of, this is what, what happened after my four years of studying and searching. I, I had read the Sontag and I had read the Sachs and I knew about this inequality. Uh, and I knew also how to fix it. Uh, I knew that you fix it with story, that story would work the way it has always worked. And I just started to think, like, someone, someone has just got to make a story about Lyme disease. Someone has to do it. I mean, there's one, and there is one documentary, too. But, but someone's got to make, you know, tell this story. Someone has to do it. And, and of course, I, you probably know where this is going. Um, last year, I made this step, I took this move from scholar to storyteller. And this was not at all an easy step for me. Uh, this was not an easy step for me because, uh, first of all, um, I'd spent so long not talking about my dad's sickness. I had spent 14 years, in fact, protecting my dad and covering up the sickness that the thought of uncovering it just sort of terrified me. Uh, and for another thing, the idea of making a story about my dad's illness went against every part of my personality. I am 
a perfectionist. I'm a, a real perfectionist, and this was a messy, messy story. Uh, I'm a private person. I'm extremely introverted, uh, which for TED folks, that means that I only have ideas that are worth keeping to myself. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, so I just kind of looked at this, and I was, I was terrified of it. Um, and the person who kind of gave me the push from the sidelines was actually the other half of this Paris Mountain Scout team or filmmaking team that Paul just mentioned is my husband, Chris. And he said, you know, you really just sh should start writing a blog and just see how it goes. And I'm not, I, I don't like writing blogs. I mean, blogs are just like for people who sit on screened in porches with a cup of hot tea. They're not, they're not for me. You know, I'm like, I have all these messy, disjointed, broken thoughts. But I thought, well, maybe I'll write a blog that is messy and broken and disjointed and kind of see what happens. So we did that, or, or I did that. Um, and then Chris came back to me and said, well, now we, we should make a movie. We should turn this blog into a movie. Um, so that's what we did last year. Uh, we made this film about Lyme disease. We made Get Better. And as I was doing the blog and as I was making this film, I had to let go of a, a whole lot of things that I didn't even realize I was holding on to. I, I had to let go of my perfectionism, of course. I had to let go of uh, my need to be right all of the time. I had to let go of grad school. I, I left. Um, and with grad school, I had to let go of my need to be like just really clever and smart. Um, I, <laughs> I, had to, um, I, had to, I had to let go of all of these things. And, um, in order to make this film. And I had to let go of, this was probably the most important thing, just this desire to tell it like it is and to get like swift justice. Like my dad was treated wrong by culture and by society and I need to make this right. Um, that, when, when you start actually telling a story, that doesn't really play into it at all. And I was, I was afraid that when I let go of my desire for justice that truth would, stu would, uh, would suffer. Um, what happened instead is that it transformed into this really interesting and better truth where I quit seeing my dad's story as uh, this bitter irony, and I started seeing it as something better and something beautiful and really more like symbolism or a perfect ending. As we were making this film, um, and I was letting go of things, what really came out and kept coming back and back to it as we were making it was just this idea of courage. So I'm not going to tell you the whole story of the film, obviously. I'm going to give you the setup very briefly. We have this little introverted, dark-haired girl here, and um, she has a sick dad and she just kind of hides away, and she's, she's hiding this whole time. And we give her kind of a, a nasty boss, and then we let her friend come in from New York to help her make this video for her, her dad, this life video of her dad's story, and everything just falls apart. And the video doesn't get finished, and the dad dies, and the daughter and the dad have sort of a half conversation and then don't get to sort of say what they need to say to each other. And I know it sounds like a real... A real tr fun trip, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> I know you all want to just go rush out and see it now. Um, so, so we make this, and uh, at the very end, we have the friend send this unfinished video to the daughter, and also send this letter that the dad wrote while the friend was there. And um, the letter is sort of her dad's chance to have five more minutes with his daughter. Because when, when my dad died, I kept thinking, like, I just want five more minutes. I just want five more minutes. And I don't know who I was talking to, but I was just really convinced that if I could have five more minutes, everything would be fine. Uh, so we did this in the form of the letter. And at the end of the letter, the, the dad says, you know, he's kind of talking to this, uh, the friend, and he says to her, he's explaining the disease, and he's explaining his daughter, Ellie. And he says, you know, when I first got sick, when I started losing my words, Ellie went silent too, out of sadness or shame or both. I've watched her twist in on herself, and I worry that it's too late. She's too far gone. She spent too long waiting in the shallow end of her own life, and everything feels desperate. But I can't shake this persistent dream where I wake up and I am back. I am back, and I feel my brain starting to stir. I jump out of bed, and the day is brilliant and bright, and so is my mind, and my words are all in place. So I shout and my voice is so strong and so clear that it cuts through years of sorrow at the first sound. Years of chaos and confusion and hesitation fall away on every side, and there, in the clearing, I see my girl, poking at the dirt with a stick or playing in the creek and letting everything get just as messy as it needs to be. She pushes her hair out of her eyes with the back of her hand. She runs over, and I say, courage, courage, Ellie, take heart. So what I wanted to say to you today is just this. I hope that I can meet you in the clearing. Maybe you're here and you haven't faced that moment where everything you've worked for has fallen away in an instant. 
but I hope that when you do, you'll have the courage to let people see you as you are and not as you wish you could be. Maybe you're here and you're part of the medical profession and you're thinking, great, we're under attack from all sides and now this person is telling us that we have to include story into our practice as well. It's already hard enough and I, I know that. I know, but I hope that you'll have the courage to understand that deeply human stories happen where people get sick. I hope you'll have the courage to be fascinated. Maybe you're here and you have Lyme disease or someone you love has Lyme disease or another invisible illness. You need the most courage of all. I hope that you'll have the courage to break that sound barrier and to try to communicate the incommunicable and not wait 14 years to do it. I can't promise that if you do this, we'll see results like tomorrow or next week or even this year or even in your lifetime, but I can promise that story will work the way it has always worked. So I hope you have the courage to say simply, we are here without apology and without anger and without agenda and trust that your story will work. Thank you.